Another policy that Muawiyah would push forward was that of investing into his security forces. There were no security forces before like Muawiyah's, not in the time of the first, the second or the third Khalifa. He had special police for special laws. So in the time of Umar bin Khattab, if some people made some mistakes, of course they would be punished if they had to be, but their homes wouldn't be destroyed. They wouldn't have their lives and livelihoods destroyed. They wouldn't be taken and tortured. They wouldn't be killed in some cases. Muawiyah had struck fear into the heart of people. And the security forces would often spy and look especially for those they would call Turabi. Turabi meant that you were a lover of Abu Turab, a lover of Imam Ali alayhi So the lovers of Imam Ali alayhi they had a special punishment. These spies would literally write down every small action that townspeople would do. Any small mistake was a grave mistake. He would kill on presumption. You were guilty until you were proven innocent. So anyone who truly loved Imam Ali, their life was in utter danger. Their lives and the lives of their children. We had special forces just for this. And this was the first terrorist government under the geese of Islam. The first time. When we see in today, in the modern era, people who claim to run their countries and nations by Islam, but run it in a terrorist fashion, they're following, they're following this methodology. Another policy that Muawiyah invested in was that of the Umayyad army, which became a famous army, but for the wrong reasons. It was a merciless army. It was not like usual armies. Usual armies want to go and want to achieve their aims and goals, like the hunting dog. But this army was not like the hunting dog. This army was like the wolf. It would continue to play with your meat after having eaten. This army, when it would attack, it would not attack only to defeat another army. It wanted to humiliate and destroy. They would go into villages and they would burn houses to the ground. They would burn trees to the ground. They would burn food. They would kill on sight. They would pillage. They would rape. They would do whatever they had to do to cause chaos and destruction and strike fear into the hearts of people so that no one would dare stand in their way. Muawiyah had built a momentum that he could not stop. He had to keep the pressure on the people because there was a fear of revolt always if he was ever to take his foot off the gas. So it continued and continued in this way that no one would dare stand against the Umayyad army. Muawiyah's policy of wealth even differed than those before him. His predecessors, even though they had their own ways of distributing wealth, even though Uthman ibn Affan and Umar ibn Khattab had their own ways of distributing wealth, they never considered their treasury to be their personal wealth. Whereas Muawiyah considered the money in Baytul Muslimin to be his money. And he would retract it from who he wished. It was his. The way in which he would distribute was based on it being his money. This had never happened before in the Ummah. He had starved the people of Iraq and the people of Medina. Any of those places which showed loyalty to Imam Ali, all those people who had once shown loyalty to Imam Ali now were to pay the price. It got to a point in Medina that people had to sell their homes to get by because they did not receive a dime. Until at one point there was not a camel in sight in all of Medina, not one camel remained. And the way that he would distribute the wealth was very unfair. At times when people would come to take their money, there is one report where he gave a man 500 dirhams and the man said, is this all you will give me? And Muawiyah replied, if you want more, you have to be like those people that I bought their religion from. And so he says, fine, buy my religion from me, if it means I make more money. So he said, then I buy your religion from you. He would literally mock, mock the religion. Another man, when he received his money, as he was leaving, Muawiyah said, wait, wait, were you in the battle of Jamal? Were you fighting against Imam Ali? And the man said, yes. He said, give him more money. So based on what you did before, you are now going to be rewarded or punished. Then he called for the man known as Ziyad. Now we know him as Ziyad ibn Abi, the son of his father, because his father wasn't known. He called for Ziyad. And he said, Ziyad, I want you to work for me. Ziyad at first refused, but Muawiyah sent him a letter saying, from Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, ila Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. He said that you are my brother. We have the same father. So even though his father wasn't known, he allowed him to claim that his father was Abi Sufyan. Now, it was known that Ziyad's mother was an adulteress. And it's known that if you are the son of an adulteress and adulterer, then you cannot lead the Jama'ah prayer, you're known as Ibn Zina. Yet he brought Ziyad ibn Abi, and he made him the governor of Kufa, and he made him pray the Jama'ah prayer in front of all the Shia in order to humiliate them, even though the Salat was batila, and everyone knew it was, they couldn't do anything about it. So Ziyad would do whatever he wanted. Muawiyah wanted to humiliate all those who ever showed loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he would continue to hunt them down, or blind them, or cut off their hands, or exile them, or disperse them. The Shia of Ali were never allowed to be united, always dispersed. And Muawiyah made sure that he made the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib a tradition. One that you had to follow, that you could not stand against. If you stood against it, then you would also be punished. You had to engage in it. And it became a culture of loyalty. So what would happen is, because it was a tradition now and it was highly rewarded, and those who didn't do it, or those who were known as Turabi, were going to re be reported to the spies and the government, businesses that would compete in the marketplace, they would go and report each other that he is a lover of Ali ibn Abi Talib, or he is one that doesn't curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? So that the government forces can come and destroy and burn down the competing business. So imagine, everyone tried to show their loyalty more 
loud and proud by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is how you showed that you were on side with the government. And if you didn't do that, then you were to lose your livelihood. You were to lose your business. So people would compete each other in cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the level that it got to. You had to be close to the people in power. And if you refused, it was no one would happen. Like the great companion, Hujr ibn Uday, the companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam, he refused and he stood against the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he was a man of great stature. He was a famous tribesman. He was of great stature amongst his clan. He had a large clan. He had a large group of friends. Him, he and his group were taken and they were to be killed because they refused to stand. They refused to remain silent in the face of this tyranny. And they refused to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib and they spoke against it. You were not allowed to speak against it. And Hujr even had to watch his son die in front of him. He requested, his final request was, if you're going to kill us, kill my son in front of me. So I make sure that he does not become weak at the point of death and turn his back on his master, Ali ibn Abi Talib. I want to make sure, I want to oversee his death and make sure he dies upon a firm and pure creed, a pure aqidah as a lover of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then you can kill me. So he watched his son die in front of him and ensured that his son remained strong in his final moments. And then they killed his son and they killed Hujr. Again and again and again. The Shia of Imam Ali salam, were hunted down and oppressed. These were very difficult 10 years under the rule of Muawiyah whilst Imam al-Hasan was still alive. But even